And it's a pleasure to be joined by Carrie Hanks, who is a former legislator and now a candidate for State House of Representatives in District 31, Seat B. So without any further ado, Carrie, thanks for joining me. What uh, what brought you to this place where you're running for office again? Thank you, Brian. It's good to be with you today. So uh, I never plan on being in politics, but I've always just tried to be involved and, and be somewhat informed as what's going on. So in like 2012, I didn't like who was running for office <laughs> as uh, we had redistricting then. So I threw my hat in the ring. I came in a distant second out of four and I thought that's enough for me. So then um didn't like what our legislators were doing in 2014, but of course I didn't step up because I was done. 2016, um, my good friend, Joanne Wood, who is a, a 32 year uh, legislator, she asked me to run, a couple other people did. And I, I just said, been there, done that. But I had kind of a cool experience where um, Rafael Cruz was, um, in Idaho Falls, and he was speaking, and he said, uh, Christians don't get involved in politics because it's such a dirty business, but if only evil people are involved, then only evil people are elected, and that really struck me at my heart, and so I did step up. I ran, and I won in 2016, served that term. Um, my current opponent actually beat me in 2018, uh, I served another term and <laughs> and I've been out this uh, this term, but I I've just watched my opponent's votes, his voting record, and I just don't feel that it reflects the um, what we believe here in Eastern Idaho in our in our district. Uh, we we have Lemhi, Clark, Jefferson, and Fremont, and I just don't believe that um, his voting record reflects what our uh, residents, our citizens of this district would like to see. So jumped in again and been working very hard since last April or May when I decided to run. Yeah, that, that's an interesting setup. Uh, you've, you've had two rematches. You had, uh, um, you know, you were defeated in, a, or you, you defeated. Um... Two term. He was a two term. Yeah. Incumbent. Yeah, and then um, you, you you defeated the incumbent in 2020, mm -hmm. and then he came back and defeated you in 2022, and now you're back running against the person you ran against in 2018. Just trying to get it all straight. So, oh, I know it's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> you know, you, you last faced the incumbent in 2018. That feels like a lifetime ago. Uh, I mean, in the yeah history of our country and our state, uh, so many things have changed, um, you know, especially yeah, obviously the, the COVID lockdowns, I think, showed how important it is yeah. to have people in the legislature and in your city councils and county commissions who uh, really care and really um, believe in the principles of liberty and don't just, uh, you know, don't just say so. Um, Absolutely. So in, in those six years now, you know, what changes have you seen and how does that affect the way you're campaigning this year? Well, um, I didn't campaign, campaign very, real hard in 2018 because I thought my record would speak for itself because I keep hearing, you know, that um, people believe in less government, they want less regulations, all those things. And I kind of took it for granted that people were paying more attention. So I, I did get defeated. And um, so I guess... Now, uh, I just, re I, we're going door to door um, and people really like that actually. They they say, hey, we've never had anybody come to our door before. And I just tell them that I'm here for you. I'm here to serve you, the people. I'm not here to serve the special interests or the lobbyist groups. I, I have like 12 grandchildren that live in Idaho. So I have a vested interest in preserving what we do have here. So uh, it, it seems to be resonating really well. Um, 
people have contacted me wanting signs and I'm, I'm just about out of signs. So that's pretty cool. Um, my fundraising, people have been generous, have shared 20, 25, 500, a thousand dollars. And it's really helped because um, mailers are about $5,000 a piece and um, you know, media ads, uh, newspaper ads. We're, we're just trying to cover all the bases and just get the message out that, that you have a really good choice as far as um, uh, somebody that votes for more government and somebody that votes against more government. So I'm just going to turn off my phone. I just realized it's on. Sorry. Okay. I'm looking over at uh, your district map. Um, district 31, like you said, Lemhi County, Clark, Fremont, Jefferson County. That's a large area. And yeah. It's, it's not it's not the largest one, but it's very large because it goes from Dubois to Island Park to Salmon, uh, Ryrie, St. Anthony, Newdale. It's just it is a pretty big area. And, and you're and right up against the Montana border. And yes. it's a lot of national forest and looks like rural areas. Yes. But, uh, Mining, uh, yeah. some timber. Yeah. A so, lot of agriculture, a lot of ranches and farming here. How does that translate into, um, you know, how you represent that district in the legislature? What are the unique challenges of that district and what are the people you're talking to there? What are their concerns? Well, actually, the ones I've talked to, their biggest concern is property taxes. They're very <laughs> concerned uh, to be taxed out of their homes. So that's a very concerning issue. And actually, the second biggest issue that they've um been concerned about is our second amendment rights. You know, we we think in conservative Idaho we're protected, but there have been bills that would threaten some of our uh, second amendment rights and even the ranked choice voting. It's a big concern that that would uh, get more liberal, more middle of the road uh, uh, representatives, officials in that would be okay with restricting our rights. So those are the probably the two biggest things illegal immigration is a concern um so we actually ran a family farm for about 36 years and we still live on our farm we have leased it out and so i am familiar with how difficult it can be to run a farm especially when we keep getting more regulations and uh, my opponent actually floated a bill that would have changed the super majority on uh, bond elections to 55%. That would open the floodgate for not just school bonds, but uh, city and county bonds, all kinds of bonds that would be much easier to pass at the 55% rate. My philosophy is that if we're going to pass a bond and put bondage, more bondage on our people, more taxes, then we should have two thirds of the community that are in support of that. So that's a that's a big deal as far as, you know, our farms and ranches and, and the ground that they run and it would make a difference in their property taxes. So um, and I so I still work. Um, you I have been working in the spring last year, but this year I wasn't able to because I'm campaigning. So I really missed it. But um, I like to drive in the harvest and and in the spring to help a local farmer. Um, they are having a hard time finding help. My grandson was actually asking me if he said, asked if I could help or anyone I knew that could help drive truck this year and, and um, kind of missing out on that, but I love meeting with the people. So I, I just think it's vital that people know they have a good choice. And so, so yeah, those are, that's kind of some of the uh, issues that we've addressed as we've gone door to door and in our forums and in our um, meet and greets. So I'm um, looking at the list on my website. Uh, it's the incumbent has been endorsed by IACI, which represents <laughs> businesses, as well as the Farm Bureau, which ostensibly re represents farmers, right? Do you see a disconnect between organizations like that and you know the small businesses and small farmers that uh, make up the state? Oh, absolutely. And I have talked to people that are in the Farm Bureau that they're a little alarmed at some of the things that 
that organization is supporting. And, um, you know, I think maybe they shouldn't have endorsed anybody in this race because I have a good record of, um, I've been on the agriculture committee, the, the two terms that I served. And I, I know about farming <laughs> and um, we did turn in some uh, uh, questionnaires to the Farm Bureau, but you know, it's sad, as you say, those organizations, they, they are actually Farm Bureau's part of IACI and they don't 100% subscribe to what IACI represents. But you know, when you, when you get an organization, when you get in that conglomerate like that, it gets easier and easier to uh, follow what they do. And, and I've even had discussions with uh, a couple of the lobbyists uh, from Farm Bureau, and I've said, you know, this doesn't follow with your policy. I actually have the policy here for Farm Bureau, and I believe, like, I believe it. I I have read it, and I actually uh, used some of their policy in answering their questions, and I would, I'd be really surprised if my opponent did that, but um, I am familiar with the policy and yeah, there's there's other organizations too. I didn't even check NRA because they're kind of a little bit different, but I'm really happy for the endorsements that I have. Uh, Think Liberty, Idaho, um, Citizens Alliance of Idaho, um, Idaho Freedom Pack, and I got 100% uh, on the Idaho Second Amendment Alliance survey. So, um, you know, if if people really want a candidate that's liberty-minded, it's very obvious who your choice is. <laughs> yeah, the one interesting thing I've noticed is that uh, both IACI and the Farm Bureau have been endorsing Democrats as well, which, I mean, that's if they want to do that, that's fine, but it really calls into question the... I, I think a lot of people, just normal voters, would identify farming and business with Republicans and conservative values. And I, I, I've seen a bit of skepticism in the Republican Party toward you know, big business lately. Um, it's maybe grown out of how they've embraced DEI and woke stuff, but also how, you know, obviously during the, the lockdowns, the big businesses weathered the storm and they got stronger while small businesses had to be shut down. And I don't know. I, I think it's driving this divide in the Republican Party, and that's that's why we see, you know, that that's one of the dividing lines. There's very few people who are endorsed by both IACI and say Idaho Freedom Pack. Oh, <laughs> so it, and it, it's it's just an interesting thing to me. I'm trying to dig into it and figure out why and figure out what we can do. Uh, how, what should the relationship between government and business be? Um, and what do you do when business becomes? too powerful. They can they can pay PACs and lobbyists and donate to legislators. And in fact, they can hold jobs hostage saying, if you don't give us subsidies, then we're going to move out of state or out of country. How, how do we how do we restore kind of an America first business model? Well, for one thing, you know, government needs to be more hands off of our businesses. Um, and, and it seems like we're developing more of these what they call um, uh, private public partnerships, mm -hmm. you know, the government is just getting more involved in our businesses. And, you know, there are, there are threats. Uh, it seems like you do better when you just go along with the government and, and uh, follow their recommendations. But I think part of that too, is that we have been taking so much federal money in Idaho that the lines are getting more blurred. So, um, you know, some of our legislators boast that we have a balanced budget. Well, it depends on how you look at it, because we take about 43% of our funding <clears throat> from the federal government. So, you know, if they, they said, look, you're going to have to, you're going to have to have, um, excuse me, just a sec. <clears throat> you're going to have to have um, the uh, males that think they're females, you're gonna have to let them into the girls' bathrooms, all that kind of stuff. The strings that are attached to that federal money, um, they could start tightening that and basically, um, you know, saying, 
you got to do things this way, which in some ways they already do, but you know, you've got to do it this way or we're going to pull that funding. And uh, so that's why it's really alarming that we're that dependent on uh, the feds for so much of our budget. Well, how do we start unwinding that? Uh, earlier this year, uh, Representative Redmond had a bill to put sideboards on Medicaid expansion. And I always hear, I've heard many legislators say that Medicaid expansion really is a good deal because the feds pay 90% of it. <laughs> but this bill that would have put certain thresholds on it, uh, a bunch of people testified against it because they were worried that those thresholds would mean it benefits would be reduced, you know, they might actually have to go to work or something. And yeah. and they, they were worried about losing their benefits. They'd become dependent on this government system, this federal system administered through the state. Mm -hmm. Are 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 there just too many people dependent on government now to be rolling it back, both individuals on welfare programs, but also companies and industries that have, you know, those public private partnerships you mentioned? How do we what? how do we scale that back without just letting everything fall to pieces? That's a great question. And, you know, I I don't even profess to have all the answers to this, but I do know that the more. So, for example, a few years ago, um, a few of us voted no on the ARPA funding in I believe it's 2020 Senate Bill uh, 1204. Well, the following year, all this funding was, I think we got like 22 billion total in Idaho, which really, you know, makes it like everybody's got all this money in all our agencies and departments. Um, and I made a commitment to vote no on those uh, bills. So I've, I've gotten nicked for voting against like funding the I defund the police and things because I voted no on those budgets. And the reason why is right in the, it's like the number two part of that uh, bill that is now law. It says, these funds are borrowed from our grandchildren. So something like, as far as possible, we should fund projects that will benefit our grandchildren. That was just very disturbing to me, where I, as I said, I have so many grandchildren living here and other people's grandchildren as well. But that um, that will really uh, put more bondage on our kids and our grandkids. And I just didn't like that. So um, I'm sure we can come up with ways. Um, and actually, I was just reading your article um, today. It was on the agencies and departments that have so much control in Idaho and they passed that bill. I, you probably remember which one it was. I don't remember the number of it, but it actually um, can limit what those agencies and departments do. So I think, I think that would help in itself because so um, in Idaho, we have like 20 agency uh, agencies that are constitution constitutionally uh, mandated. And, and if you look at our, um, our uh, agencies and departments, we have hundreds and hundreds of divisions and uh, departments within those 20 agencies. So there's a lot of loopholes. And until we trim down on some of that stuff, in fact, a lot of it we should trim down on, uh, we're not going to be able to cut our budgets. We're not going to be able to um, push back on, on some of this uh, aid that we're giving in many different ways, not just Medicaid expansion. Um, one thing I think that speaks to is a debate within the Republican Party over what's the proper role of government. Now, it's easy enough to say that the you know proper role of government, as our founders intended, was to protect life, liberty, and property, and that's it. But over the past hundred plus years, government's gotten into a lot of things. And mm -hmm. so there are some who will say that there are things government can and should do. And then others say, just, you know, trying to be pragmatic, uh, government's already here, so we can't just pull yeah. back. It's like uh, mm -hmm. agricultural subsidies. Um, during the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl, the government started subsidizing certain crops. And, right. you know, now it's so in ingrained in there that you pull it back and people yeah. fear that the entire thing will collapse. Uh, what uh, what should the role of government be? And if it's too big, how do we pull it back without letting everything, once again, fall to pieces? 
Yeah. Well, and actually I have all this stuff here because I'm just getting ready for my forum, but I love the proper role of government. It's by Ezra Taft Benson. It's just, a, it's really a great little short read, but there's a lot of powerful things um, about uh, controlling government power. Um, I just, I see that we have those differences and people have been so conditioned to depend on the government more. I mean, look what we just did with the launch program it's in its second year now. And so we're conditioning these kids uh, and their parents that it's okay to take, they, they get the scholarship basically from uh, we the people. And I just don't believe that's the proper role of government, but it's conditioning these kids to be more dependent. Um, <sighs> It, it, I just, I can't even think of all the ways that we as a society and even sadly in our state are being conditioned to take um, more government money to be de more dependent on uh, the government for things that, you know, we used to, um, the churches, there used to be private agencies that were bigger on, on helping people. And I always liked what Reagan said about um, if you give a person a fish, you you feed them for a day. But if you teach them the fish, you give them basic, I can't remember his exact words, but a lifetime skill. And so I think we've gotten away from that. I mean, in Idaho, government's just growing and growing. And we have several so-called Republicans. They're, I call them liberal Republicans that I, I just don't think they're uh, ascribing to the Constitution or the Idaho GOP platform, which I think is a great platform. And I did sign my integrity and affiliation because uh, I agree with everything that's in that platform. Yeah, that's uh there's a lot of stuff in there and a lot of stuff in the constitution too. And that's, that's kind of what I was aiming at with the previous question, because a lot of our constitution was written in a progressive era. So things like public education, you know, the, yeah. if, if you go back to a purely, I don't know, libertarian idea, the idea of government paying for education, it seems almost perverse, but we've gotten used to it. It's been the case for right. over a hundred years. Yep. Um, obviously though, we, you know, we want accountability for how tax dollars are being spent and, you know, yes. The more money that's spent, the it does not really seem to be improving um, achievement. It's uh, and, and yet that's their that's you know the the people who work in the education system and lobby for it. That's their only um, solution: more money, more money, more money. So obviously there are other options that have been presented: uh, money following the child to you know, various school choice ideas. Unfortunately, those have run into brick walls as well. The education savings account was defeated in the Senate last year, and the tax yes. credit was defeated this year in the House committee. Uh, what what would you like to see as far as school choice, if anything, and how do you get it through? How you know? It, it, it seems like it's a you know it always just gets stuck in the mud. Yeah, if Wendy Horman can't get it passed, <laughs> who can, right? <laughs> um. So I am definitely for school choice. Uh, we have shifted through the years that we fund the system and not the student. And, you know, we have lots of really great teachers in our public school system. I know some of them, because I actually work as a bus driver. So I talk to some of the, the coaches, the advisors, the um, teachers, and some of them have expressed frustration because you know, there's all these programs you have to follow this, teach the test, all this stuff, instead of letting our teachers um, teach w the, the way that they know from experience works well for kids. Um, the school choice, I have uh, personally homeschooled five of my seven children for at least one year. Um, and it's not an easy thing to do. And it's expensive too. the curriculum can be pretty expensive. And um, I just think that not all children can fit well into that public school model. So um, I know, I mean, it sounds like a lot to, to fund these kids for five or $6,000, but it, from doing it myself, I know that it is expensive, but worth it to, um, 
to, if we feel like homeschooling is the best option, if we feel like a private school is the best option. And, you know, that's money that's going into something. It, it, at this point, it's like in the school system. And so, you know, I just, I think that we need options. I think that it encourages competition. And so it just depends what the people of Idaho, if we want to, as I said, fund a system or fund our students, our future, future employees and future uh, voters, citizens. Well, when it comes to the difference between funding systems and funding students, the systems have a much stronger voice in Boise yes. than the students. So anytime yeah, students, any, yeah. any any school choice proposal comes up and a lot of people come up and say, no, you're hurting public schools, you're going to hurt your schools. And they always talk about, you know, rural schools are going to get hurt the worst. Yes. Uh, I imagine that in your district, there's a lot of rural schools. And you now what's the best way to improve them? Well, and, you know, we're, we're all getting an expansion, like people are moving into our areas, all, all of our counties. I'm not sure about Clark exactly. Um, but they're, so they're trying to like build more schools, more infrastructure, all that stuff that goes with it. And in some ways, if you can look at it this way, it does relieve some pressure on that public school system um, to have not all these students um, coming into school. Um, I've also uh, was kind of talking with the gentleman a little bit um, about, you know, one of the challenges with public school is, at least in, you know, his point of view and others that I've actually talked to is that there's a different, um, they uh, receive their funding based on attendance as opposed to enrollment. And I, I just, I'm wondering if we can really look at that. I know they've um, talked about it before. And so that's an option too, to look at the enrollment because, you know, most people want their kids at school. Um, you know, there's a few that they have a hard time getting them there, but it just seems like um, that's something that, that um, administrations have that I've talked to people in the administration say that would be a helpful change is to do the enrollment. So, um, you know, I'm willing to look at those things. Um, as I said before, where I'm not a politician, I don't have all the answers, but um, I think that we need to look at, at different options for parents to do what's best for their children. Shifting gears a little bit, uh, you're, you know, one of a handful of challengers this year who have been there before. So, you know, you have a perspective that perhaps people who are new to the game don't. When you're in there, obviously, you, you know that you're surrounded by a lot of people, lobbyists who, you know, for better or for worse, they're all, they all know what they're talking about as far as their fields and, you know, their job is to be persuasive. And you've got the executive staff who, you know, oftentimes they have their own agenda that they are yeah. you know, pushing on behalf of. Uh, Leading Idaho. <laughs> how do you stay grounded? How do you stay um, connected to your constituents, especially when you're so far away from your own district? Yeah. Well, and I I have uh, come home a lot on those weekends. It's a 320 plus miles home, but I feel like it's <clears throat> important to be home as, as much as I can. Um, but I, I do send email updates, even now that I'm not in the legislature, I still have kept my list. And so I uh, inform like local people, as well as those that have just signed up for my uh, email that may not be all here. Um, I put out the update on Facebook page and now Twitter too, X. Uh, so I just, I try to keep people informed and, you know, I have people around me that we kind of joke, they wouldn't allow me to go off the rails. Um, they would let me know that I'm, <laughs> I'm, um, not, not following what I, what I've committed to do. So I don't know it, in some ways it can be difficult just because, you know, I get all this, she wants to defund the police. She supports marijuana, blah, blah, blah. Because I don't 
and I, and I, I'm not for either one of those, either defund the police or do I support marijuana legalization. But when you, when you vote on a bill that is either unconstitutional and, or, uh, a lot more money, uh, that I believe are budgets, they should be able to stick within their means. Like we all have to. And I also believe that we can spend our money better than government bureaucrats. I just, I don't know. I'm just a simple um, farm girl, homemaker, school bus driver. I'm like, I'm one of the people that live in my district. Um, I don't live in a gated community. <laughs> I live in a, a great rural, rural area. And so that that just keeps me grounded, I guess, because I believe so strongly in the Constitution and and I've read of our founding fathers, the things that that they have done. Um, and so sometimes when it's like, I don't want to knock another door, well, it's pretty easy for me to uh, be out there and campaign and and be talking with people compared to what our founding fathers and so many of them that were in the the war. Washington and his troops, you know, some of them can have uh, bad rags on their feet. And I just about cry when I think about it. So I have a lot easier, but I, I love Idaho and I love our country and I love those basic principles. And I believe they are God given. And so for me, actually, this is um, the ongoing war that uh, the adversary that Satan wages against God to take away our free will, to take away our choice and our our agency to choose so for me this is more religious a spiritual war than just just basic politics so once again having been there before uh some bills that come up they're easy i mean on second True. amendment you know it's yeah, for me, gonna it's be pretty easy. pretty easy to vote on that <laughs> abortion yeah uh but then there are other bills. Uh, I look back at this last session, the fentanyl bill. Uh, that that was a tough one for a lot of people because it obviously had right. good intentions. We need to stop fentanyl trafficking and keep it out of our state. Uh, but there were some questions about the way the bill was structured, how the mandatory minimums were set up, and how it shifted right. the balance of power in the system from judges to police and prosecutors. Mm -hmm. uh, however, there was enormous pressure, obviously, on everybody to uh, support it. Oh, yeah. How... When you face a, a very complex bill, how do you go about figuring out how to vote on it? There, I, there are some bills where I've skimmed it and looked at the you know um, statement of purpose, yeah. and it seems, oh, that makes sense. That's no brainer. But then I look in the details or someone points something out to me and it's, oh, wait, I did not even notice that. That completely changes the way I saw it. So how do you figure that out? So um, actually I did... Uh, uh, contact one of our sheriffs because well and and a candidate for sheriff because i wanted to see what their um ideas what what their view was on that fentanyl bill that's now law mm -hmm. and uh the sheriff actually he said that uh his bigger concern was the enforcement if they're really going to enforce that but that's what i do especially with difficult bills is i contact like if it's it affects the cities or the counties then i contact a mayor or two um county commissioners uh because they can see better how that's going to affect them and and their ability to uh, make that bill work that law so yeah i um I just have kind of a list of people and, and if more people want to be added to that, it's great. But I do usually send out like an email and say, Hey, um, what's your opinion on this bill? And so I, I just think that the more input I can get, the better because <clears throat> there are agencies and um, organizations that actually do analysis, which are, is very helpful when you have four to 600 bills in a session that you're trying to figure out. And as you say, the statement of purpose looks good, but then when you get down to the nitty gritty of it, it's like, ah, that is uh, going to affect us differently than the statement of purpose actually says. So I just, I believe the more input and uh, opinion, the better. 
So that's that's how I go about um, figuring out how I'm going to uh, vote on a bill. So we were talking earlier about the, you know, the role of government, the purpose of government, the scope of government. So, yeah. and, and since we're already involved in public education and we already supply certain, you know, hygiene products, you know, <laughs> what do you think about, you know, feminine hygiene products in, uh, you know, school bathrooms? <laughs> Oh my gosh. I know. So you're kind of referring to House Bill 313, which my opponent sponsored last year. And his floor, oh, his floor speech was just so cringy. Um, but so as a bus driver, I have been in many, many girls' bathrooms throughout the region. And there's there's supply there. It's it's there for the girls when they need it. Um and and, you know, other people have said, well, they can ask the school nurse. They can um, ask their friend. I mean, it's taken care of. And and what this bill would have done is bump the, uh, bumped it to the uh, state level of, of funding and disseminating that instead of at the local level, which it's at now. It's like there's not a problem. And so you're you're trying to come up with a solution for a non-problem. And especially it's, it's just kind of cringy that a 60 plus year old guy would be sponsoring uh, a feminine hygiene product uh, bill. Uh, one of the things that he said in this floor speech, which if anybody's interested, I can send you the link to it. It's on YouTube and it's just horrible. But um, he said that the proper role of government is to supply paper towels, toilet paper, um, soap, and these feminine hygiene products. So it's just, it's crazy. And people have started calling him 3P Rod because he talked about these three P's that I'm not going to repeat. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just, yeah, it was just so cringy. And so that's just an example of his difference with mine in um, uh, state government versus local control. That That's a really good example. It, it does call into question, you know, if if that is the proper role of government, then what isn't? Um, and because every every expansion of government, it's you know, honestly, it's not usually you know evil people twirling their mustaches saying, "How are we going to control the people?" It's more like, "Hey, we can do this. This will help some people. This will help some people." And soon, government supplying everything and controlling everything, and and that's not a good situation. You mentioned local control, though, and I know. You flip that around when the library bills came through. That was the excuse a lot of people used uh, to vote against those bills, which would establish certain thresholds for in, you know, keeping inappropriate material out of children's sections of school libraries and public libraries. Right. Uh, and, and they would say, wait a second, this is usurping local control because it's up to the local libraries and their boards to decide how they're going to handle this. So what's the difference? Well, and I actually think uh, the original House Bill 666, that's the one I support, because all it does is pulls the exemption from librarians to um, to be able to disseminate this in the library. Mm -hmm. So if if a person was outside of the library and handed a, a child gender queer they would get all the misdemeanor, they would get charged with all that. But in the library, for some reason, they're protected. And you know, five or 10 years ago, we didn't have any of these filthy books. It, it's just what happened in, in these last few years. Um, you know, I, maybe we're getting more liberal library boards. I don't know, because I actually tried to get a book out of a library several years ago that I thought was inappropriate and they couldn't see a problem with it. So that is a frustration maybe is the community standards, but I actually believe that we should just pull that, but we got kind of a soft uh, bill that's in law now. And I, 60 days to move a book from here to here. It's, <laughs> it's silly, but um, you know, we have, for whatever reason, we have laws which I think they're they're good um, against like tattoos for kids, uh, chew chew and alcohol and all this uh, suntanning, all that stuff. Um, so we just have like a basic 
standard. And actually in our Idaho constitution, it says that um, legislators are to, um, I can't remember the exact word, but protect uh, their well, morality and temperance. For, or yeah, like that. morality and temperance. And so I think that ties in as well. Um, that we we've seen it across the state that it there it's not in control that we can't protect these kids and it's and you know they say um well the parents need to do it the parents aren't there say on the school bus um some kid can can bring gender queer i'm just gonna use that because it's kind of a generic really terrible book but he could flip that open on the bus and there's all these kids that see that their parents are not there to protect them at that point. Um, even in school, to open up a book like that and to have the kids around them, that's not a, a good thing. And, you know, parents do what they can to protect their kids. But, and, uh, you know, and then there's an argument about the internet and everything. But we do what we can. And um, I actually think those books shouldn't be in the library at all. And my thinking is, that we can't have all the books that there are in the library. Like they have to choose, they have mm -hmm. to select books and let's make sure the classics are there. Let's make sure um, those ABC books and all those great little books are there for kids. And, you know, as I said, five or 10 years ago, we didn't even have this problem. Um, and if people could see the filth that is in those books and you know lawn boy some of those other ones it's just it's terrible that our that our kids have those as an option to read um because we need to protect them while they're young and they just you know their minds and everything are developing as as adults i guess if they want to get into all that but um i know of families that have talked to me of the heartache that they've had because their kids were exposed to pornography at like six, seven years old, you know, a big brother that was exposed from his friend. And then, and then the younger brother, it was there for him. It's just, you know, we parents do the best that we can. And, and so if we can get that help in the community to protect them, I just, I, I guess that maybe I rationalize, but I, I just believe that that is one way that, we need to protect our kids. Well, I've appreciated your time today. I know you've got to run to uh, something else. Is there anything we didn't cover or just, uh, you know, what are your closing thoughts? Um, just that uh, I want to serve the people and I have a voting record doing that. I have a voting record of trimming budgets. Um, and I do believe in our individual and our parental rights and we've got to protect our state be from becoming a California, a uh, Washington, Oregon, that influence is coming into our state. And we need legislators who, who will stand and say, no, we're not going to do that. And we need more than just me to get elected. There's Christy Zitto. There's some really great um, people that are running that I, I really hope they get in and, so, yeah, I mean, I have a website so people can look at that. They can contact me at that website. And um, yeah, that's that's probably good. <laughs> Terry Hanks, uh, candidate for House of Representatives, District 31, seat B. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian.